O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. We, we ask Christ to come into our lives and save us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we agree with that. that yes. It takes Christ to get to heaven, yes. okay? So we ask Christ must to... must be cleansed. Right, we must be cleansed. We ask Christ to save us. Right. Now we are at that point are forgiven of our sins. Right. Five minutes later, we walk away from the booth, we walk out of the church, we get up from wherever we were at right. where we asked Christ to save us. We walk out, we see something, we lust after it, we covet something, we do something that sin, right. five minutes later... We can't lose our salvation five minutes later. Well, I'd say we can't lose it if we do some things the Bible requires us to do. Yeah. Now, let's go to 1 John, and that answers in chapter 2, verse 1. Sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate. So, first of all, the, the first right. verse is talking about that you sin not. Right. But it's a may, it's a condition, it's, it's, a, it's a free freedom of choice to do. But if we sin, not because we sin every day in thought, word, and deed, but if we sin, we have an advocate, a lawyer, Christ Jesus, a mediator with the Father, but we have we have to do something. We have to confess it, and we have to turn from it. Exactly, right, right there it says it. I mean, that's First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. Right, he's just and faithful, forgive us our sins. But it's an if. It's an if we sin, not because we sin all the time. Yeah, and it's an if we confess, too. <laughs> That's right. I agree with that 100%. It's if we sin, if we confess, or if we sin, we confess, and we turn from those things. But then in 1 John 2, 3, and 4, it says that there's a way we can know we're saved. Now, I'm going to give you the New King James Version because I haven't, I haven't uh, memorized the King James. But in 1 John 2, 3, and 4, it says you can know that you know that you're saved if. That word if is in the King James as well. I'm pretty sure. Keep his commandments. Yeah. So not if we disobey him, we're not sure. We have this lack of assurance uh, in disobedience. The clip you have just witnessed is a very good example of oppositions of science, falsely so called. Paul gave warning to Timothy to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. Oppositions of science or knowledge falsely so-called, is a framework of error in which two seemingly opposite positions clash together, and yet due to the fact that the entire framework is error, the result of the clash will also be error. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he hath married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, unto the seventh, and last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are given in marriage but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Now the Sadducees were a sect that did not believe in the afterlife. Therefore they did not believe in the resurrection. Thus they didn't believe any rewards or penalties after death. Thus in questioning Jesus on the resurrection, they took the example of marriage in this world and extrapolated it to the next. Obviously thinking that they had presented Jesus with a quandary as it pertains to the notion of a resurrection. What is interesting in that exchange though is how Jesus responded to them. He said to them, Ye do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. In dealing with both the Sadducees and the Pharisees, Jesus would not answer them in accordance with their folly. The Sadducees and the Pharisees had different perspectives in regards to quite a few issues and were thus opposed to each other. Yet their opposition we could call an opposition of science or knowledge, falsely so called. Now there is nothing new under the sun. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. 
and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of old time which was before us. A modern example of an opposition of science falsely so called is the once saved, always saved versus losing salvation debate. Generally speaking, on one side of the debate, you have those whom hold to once saved, always saved, terms like eternal security or perseverance of the saints may be bandied about. Generally, this side falls under the auspices of Calvinism. And on the other side, you have those who hold to the view that you can lose your salvation. This side falls under the auspices of Arminianism and moral government. Here you will find the theology of people like John Wesley and Charles Finney upheld. The fundamental flaw in this debate is that salvation is viewed from both sides as being positional as opposed to something manifest. What I mean by that is that salvation is a manifest state of being. In Romans 8.2 we read, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death simply being that if you sin, you die. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The Bible teaches that it is the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus which sets us free from the law of sin and death. Thus, when we're abiding in Christ, walking after the Spirit, it's an abiding manifest state, then we are no longer sinning unto death. Hence, in that condition, there is no condemnation, as it says in Romans 8.1. This is what redemption in Christ Jesus means. Salvation is not a position, it is a manifest abiding state. A state in which we have been redeemed from all iniquity and purified, and thus we're zealous of righteousness. This is the very reason that Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Titus 2.14 A pure heart is pure. It does not work iniquity. The love of God has been shed abroad in the heart through the washing of regeneration, through the process of repentance and faith. Now we are complete in him, whom is the head of all principality and power, in whom we are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, which is repentance, where we die with him, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And that's the washing of regeneration, where we are quickened by the Spirit. Hence the scripture says that we've been quickened together with him, you know, having been dead in our sins, and now we are forgiven. So if we are truly saved, 
we have entered into a manifest state, having had the law of God written in our hearts and upon our minds. We read in Hebrews, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, living way, the spirit of life in Jesus Christ, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore a punishment suppose, yea, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him who that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So now with that understanding, that salvation is a manifest state, inclusive of heart purity, a state we enter into through repentance and faith, having been cleansed inwardly of all iniquity in the heart, all rebellion purged, whereby we are yielded to God, where His grace works in us, to will and to do of His good pleasure, in which the law of God has been written upon our hearts and in our minds. Can you understand how this state is not something that you can go in and out of over and over again because to do so would bring it would represent a defilement in the heart like a license to sin it would be a position where hey I can I can sin and get away with it and that is guile Paul wrote but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whom iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now Paul was quoting David, where it is written, A psalm of David, Mashi, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. See, David connects a spirit in which there is no guile, no deceit, with the individual who's been forgiven and whose sin is covered, the man whose faith is reckoned as righteousness. See, faith being reckoned as righteousness has to do with the faith of an upright heart. See, it's, it's representative of a condition, a manifest condition of the heart, not a position. Salvation is a state, not a position. This is why the righteousness of faith is a faith that works by love. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. See, that's what avails a faith that works by love. Why does it avail? Because love works no ill. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this, saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbour. Therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Where is the boasting then? It is excluded. 
By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. The key is love out of a pure heart. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which is agape or love in the Greek, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Paul has given emphasis here that everything is secondary to love out of a pure heart. If we don't have love, all the law keeping, the good works, the, the charity, everything else, the, the keeping a moral life, it's all in vain if we don't have love. True righteousness abideth in love. And while we do grow in grace and knowledge, as Peter taught, for we do see through a glass darkly in many ways, and then through growing in grace and knowledge, we come face to face, but there has to be a foundation of love out of a pure heart. Otherwise, nothing else matters. Salvation is a manifest state of having been redeemed from all iniquity and having been purified. And then in that state, we can grow to be more Christ-like in our understanding, our wisdom. We put off misunderstandings, foolishness, vanities. But all the while, we are upright in heart, because there is no guile. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some have swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. Now with that in mind, let's take a closer look at some clips. That you sin not. But it's a may, it's a condition, it's, it's, a, it's a free freedom of choice to do. But if we sin, not because we sin every day in thought, word, and deed, but if we sin, we have an advocate, a lawyer, Christ Jesus, a mediator with the Father, mm -hmm. but we have we have to do something. We have to confess it, and we have exactly, to turn from it. Nine, exactly, right, right there it says it. I mean, that's First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. Right, he's just yeah. and faithful to forgive us our sins. Right. But it's an if. It's an if we sin, not because we sin all the time. Yeah, and it's if we confess, too. <laughs> That's right. I agree with that 100%. It's if we sin, if we confess, or if we sin, we confess, and we turn from those things. But then in 1 John 2, 3, and 4, it says that there's a way we can know we're saved. Now, I'm going to give you the New King James Version because I haven't, I haven't uh, memorized the King James. But in 1 John 2, 3, and 4, it says you can know that you know that you're saved if. That word if is in the King James as well. I'm pretty sure. Keep his commandments. Yeah. So, not if we disobey him, we're not sure. We have this lack of assurance uh, in disobedience. I want you to notice that in that clip, 
that there is no implication whatsoever of purity of heart in salvation. The deception here is very subtle. What is implied is a sin repent cycle where one can step in and out of the light and thus be saved, unsaved, saved, unsaved. The measure for salvation is merely the adherence to commandments in the present moment and not love out of a pure heart which is the real factor of why one keeps the commandments. So in this clip we have two opposing camps at work. One, that the position cannot be lost, once saved always saved. And we've got on the other side we got that salvation can be lost, but when one loses their salvation, you know, rebels against God, they can just confess that sin and be restored and continue on where they left off. To make this point even clearer, I want you to take a look at the next clip. I know of people recently who've written me who have felt condemned because of an improper uh, interpretation of these verses. and um, There may be some here who are feeling the same way or have felt the same way in the past because of not understanding what these verses are saying, particularly verse 26. Chapter 10, as we go into it now, the old covenant sacrifices were insufficient and they were simply shadows of Christ who, is, who was to come. Okay, so we have all these things in mind now. Chapter 1, Jesus is the Son, greater than the angels. Chapter 2, even though he's greater and is the Son, he's just human, just like us, in every way. Chapter 3, Christ was faithful, so we need to be faithful. Chapter 4, don't follow in the footsteps of the Israelites who didn't enter into the Promised Land. Chapter 5, Christ was the great high priest. Chapter 6, if we don't progress in the faith, continue in sanctification, we are in great danger. Chapter 7, Christ was in the order of Melchizedek as a great high priest, not Aaron. Chapter 8, there's a new covenant now. Chapter 9, Christ's death started the new covenant. And chapter 10, the Old Testament sacrifices were insufficient. They were just shadows. And now we come to verse 26. And let's read there, starting there, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses, <coughs> Moses' law, without, dies without mercy on a testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose? Will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So verse 26, many people have misunderstood this to mean that if they're uh, is talking about just any willful sin. But here's the problem with that, friends. In verse 26, it's talking about just any willful sin, any sin at all. Guess what? You no longer have a sacrifice for sins. Now you have a great problem. And let's face it. Every single person here, since you've come to a knowledge of the truth, has sinned willfully. And so that's what it's referring to, friends. You have no sacrifice for sins left. And if you have no sacrifice for sins left, guess what? You have no forgiveness of sins. You're condemned. And let's face it, the whole world would be condemned. There may be people out there who are new Christians who haven't sinned yet since conversion. There may be people who haven't sinned in 25 years for all I know. But if you sin once, if that's what the interpretation we're going to take here, we're all in trouble. Is there anyone in here who hasn't sinned since their conversion? If you have, praise God, I'm not trying to shame you if you haven't. Praise the Lord if you haven't. But I think we can all say we have. So that's not what it's talking about, friends. That's why I wanted to give you an overview first of this. And we see, what did Hebrews 10 talk about? The Old Testament sacrifices were insufficient. This verse is referring to one specific sin, which you'll see, as you read it through, you'll understand it properly, this whole chapter here, this whole, this whole passage here, the, the, the sin they're committing here is rejecting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and going back to the Old Testament sacrifice which Paul just proved in Hebrews 10 were insufficient to make them perfect, insufficient to take away their sins for good because that's why they kept offering year in and year out. 
By disconnecting heart purity from salvation, salvation becomes positional. This is a rejection of, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, which is in the context of Jesus giving himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And the reason that no sacrifice remains is because the sacrifice which does that is voided if we're willfully sinning. Because we're obviously not perfected forever if we're sinning willfully against our knowledge of the truth. If salvation is a position, then by necessity the sacrifice by which one obtains that position is an abstract principle. Hence, if one leaves the position, then the sacrifice still remains. But if salvation is a manifest state, inclusive of a redemption of all iniquity and the establishment of purity of heart, entered into via the blood of Jesus Christ, the outcome being a washing, a cleansing, a purging of the conscience, then clearly for one to return or engage in rebellion once again, that sacrifice which produced that no longer remains. The scriptures teach that it is with boldness that we enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, his example, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with the pure water. So what is established is this. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. See, the, the law is written upon the heart and in the mind. That is the manifest reality. It's the purpose of the commandment. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. There is no sacrifice for ongoing willful sin, because the purpose of the sacrifice is to perfect those whom are sanctified forever. Keep that in mind when reading this passage. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore a punishment suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. See, to willfully sin from a state of having been cleansed is to despise the grace of God that brought you there. The grace of God that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, to live soberly, uprightly and godly in the present age. Salvation is premised on transformation, not a position. A transformation in which we've been redeemed from all iniquity and purified, whereby we're zealous of good works. I know I repeat this point, but it is so important to understand. We are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's the spirit of life in Christ, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Remember, we enter into the holiest of holies with boldness by the blood of Jesus Christ. In offering Himself on our behalf, Jesus declared His righteousness for the remission of sins, for the sins that are past not present or future sins, hence no sacrifice remains for willful sin or rebellion to God. We read, To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. And then if we go down a few verses, it says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. And if we look at Romans chapter 8 again, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now compare that to where Peter wrote about how we are purged from our old sins. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, adding to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Imagine marriage was a position, that two people get married, and then say one of them goes and commits adultery, so they lose their position. Then... They stop committing adultery, and then they're back in the position. Then a little while later, they go commit adultery again, so they lose their position. See, that is reflective of iniquity in the heart. A pure heart does not do that. We're to be cleansed once and for all. Pure is pure. The central theme of the message of Christ was that of heart purity. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within, the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. And Jesus said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. There is no sin-repent cycle taught in the scripture. We are not to repent of our repentance. Godly sorrow works a repentance not to be repented of. Paul wrote, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. The root of rebellion in the heart is destroyed once and for all, and thereby the willful sin stops once and for all. So today, what we witness in the world is a Babylonian church system which comprises of many flavours of error, from the broad spectrum of those who teach unconditional eternal security, premised upon the righteousness of Jesus being credited to their account, and their sins being credited to Jesus, whereby God can somehow no longer see the manifest wickedness that still resides within, to those who contend for holiness, yet advocate a second work of grace, before true inward purity is obtained. Thus God overlooks the remaining inward defilement for a time. All the way over to much of the street preacher movement, who advocate that one must stop sinning and yet still imply a sin repent cycle. Then we have the Catholics, who contend for a Christianity with a high standard of morality, but connected to a system of sacraments, as well as the division of iniquity into big willful sins versus little willful sins that which they call the venial sins and mortal sins. But it doesn't end there. We have the Russian and Greek Orthodox, with all their pomp and show. Then we have many flavours in between, teaching all sorts of different things, yet none of them contending for a once and for all cleansing and the associated purity of heart by which we abide in the spirit of life in Jesus Christ, wholly reconciled to God. Think about it. God bless you all. And thank you for listening.